Eric, welcome to the Happy Engineer Podcast. It's awesome to have you, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Zach, for having me. I'm so happy and honored to be here, so thank you. So for those on audio only today, they're missing out on an incredible background. Be Eric, before the interview, we were talking about this Macintosh on your wall, and it's taking me back to my childhood bedroom where I had a Mac, so I just thank you for bringing me back to a really nostalgic <laughs> moment. <laughs> It's funny. Um, I often, you know, people ask if it's a real background, and I'll walk back there, and I'll pull the floppy disk out. And that's talk about nostalgia. People so see that, they're like, "Whoa, and, floppies!" You know, yeah. The engineering leader listening appreciates the three and a half inch floppy. So good, good yeah. times. So Eric, in you know the bio we read about you, your resume, your experience, it's all over the place. Real estate, podcasting, entrepreneurship, investing, personal branding, financial freedom. There's so many threads we could pull, and when I look at your life, I can't help but see what we call lifestyle engineering at Oeko at its finest. Absolutely crafting something that's serving your highest vision and values in the world. And it begs the question then, with everything you have going on, I hate to start with such a trite, worn out question, but how do you answer the question, what do you do? Yeah. It used to be a challenge at barbecues, especially when I left <laughs> corporate America, because, you know, I was there for over 20 years and I left, you know, I was a creative, worked my way up from as a junior art director, all the way up to the top of the food chain, which is a creative director in my field. That's what I was known for, right? Two decades. And when I left and I decided to become a real estate investor, that was confusing for everyone and less for me, but there was some confusion along the way. But that conversation was odd because my, my, my challenge and goal was to create financial freedom for myself. So what does that mean is, and I'm sure your audience is brilliant, so they, they get it. But just for those who want to know what, exactly what that means is basically all your bills are paid by your passive income. And I grew up financially illiterate. Like mm. My parents you know, filed for bankruptcy while I was growing up. They lived a lifestyle beyond their means and racked up credit card debt. And I get it. They were immigrants from the Philippines. They were learning as they go as well. Uh, they got caught up in the materialistic game and, and, and the American dream. So I learned from their hard lessons. And I realized, wait a minute, if I can create passive income that will pay for my bills, I can live financially free at some point. So that was the thing at barbecues, yeah. Zach, was like, I am a real estate investor. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that was my first proud moment of like, I'm taking control of my life you know, and, and, and I'm looking towards the future. It also helped that I was like in my mid 40s, I was like my early 40s. So at that time, it was, a, it was a lot of discovery in different season of my life I was discovering. Real quick, the moments from your childhood Growing up without the financial literacy and this idea of financial freedom, passive income probably never entered the conversation. Can you tell me a little bit, how did bankruptcy and that childhood experience inform your money mindset growing up? And what was the moment that shifted? Because something must have changed where you actually realized there's, there's a different approach. But what was that like as a kid? It was difficult, obviously. You know, if you grow up in a household where money is a constant issue, there's a lot of arguing. I knew that wasn't a good thing, but I wasn't exactly sure how to solve that problem. So I, I started to repeat those problems, to be honest, especially when I got into corporate and, and started achieving success monetarily through my salary, working, you know, sp trading time for dollars. I did exactly. I started repeating what they were doing. I was buying cars. I was, you know, a lavish, you know, apartment. I was renting in New York City. I was renting in Princeton, New Jersey. And honestly, Zach, it wasn't until a time, and I was partying. I, trust me, I was living sure. the life. I was in my 20s. The dream to be in Manhattan, to work in Manhattan, to live in Manhattan, and to party in Manhattan, and then bring that party to Princeton, New Jersey, where I was working, that was, it, it felt like a movie. And I thought that I was cool. And I thought that I was doing whatever filled my mm. cup at the time, which was a lot of materialistic sort of things. And I was looking, I was filling a void, right? Sure, basically, sure. Uh, that I didn't know could never really be filled. So really, honestly, I'll give credit to an old ex-girlfriend of mine when I was in my early 20s. Uh, she said, why are you renting two places? Uh, that was cool to most of the girls I was dating. Like, oh, I can go stay with you in Princeton or in New York. That's awesome. 
but she was a girl, humble girl from Michigan. And she was like staying at the two places. And eventually we started getting serious. And she was like, you need to close one of these down. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what are you talking about? And she was like, yeah, get rid of the Manhattan apartment. You don't need that anymore. And she's like, why don't we just move in together? <laughs> in Princeton? So, so, I mean, wow. you know, I, I drank the Kool-Aid and, and she was way better at finances than I was. And eventually we dated for years and she kind of got my, my, my stuff together, my crap together because she started taking over the finances and we lived together and she, I saw how she operated. So I started to learn from her in my twenties. Uh, so I never really told that story before. That's so wild. So thanks man. for peeling that layer. Yeah. yeah. I, I really appreciate you sharing that, Eric. And engineering leaders, my, my clients at Oweco and the people I work with, generally speaking, pay really close attention to their finances. And mm. a lot of them are in pursuit of the same thing that you just described. Like, how do I turn career success and income that I create as a leader in engineering, you know, wh whatever level, into opportunities for passive income, you know, whether it's rich dad, poor dad, or however they got introduced to that concept, I get this dialogue a lot with our clients, you know, how do we turn this into that? The engineering leader listing is like, oh, we're going to talk about real estate today. I actually don't want to talk about that. Uh, we'll cover that maybe in another episode. But what's, what's something you said that's interesting is you had the success in your career before you went off and started all the incredible serial entrepreneurship things you're doing now. And that's actually what I want to dig into because you mentioned personal branding. And I get asked a lot of questions about how do I differentiate myself to create tremendous success in my career when there's a million other people on the planet who have the same resume as me. And personal branding has become a bit of a hot topic or a buzzword. Maybe even people ignore it now because we're talking about it so much and nobody really gets it. And this is a zone of genius for you. So can you talk about personal branding a bit in your own experience? And then we'll connect the dots. You know, how does an engineer think about this? Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. So I'll, I'll try to come back to the main topic here. And you can, you can keep me honest and, <laughs> and, and stay within the rails. But I, I realized at some point when I got into real estate investing that there were some people that I looked up to that I wanted to learn from. And there was something that differentiated them from everyone else. And that was, they were putting themselves out there, right? This is 2017, 2018, and they were on YouTube or they had a podcast that I was learning from. And I started sidling up to these folks. They became friends, they became partners, they became clients. I basically started mimicking what, what people were doing that I had close access to. So it made it real to me. It's like, if they can do it, I can do it, right? So. One of the questions you ask is like, how do you differentiate yourself? Well, they were differentiating themselves because they were putting themselves out there, right? That's, that's one thing. Not everyone puts themselves out there, right? It may look like there's a lot of people doing it, but trust me, there's a very, very, very small percentage of people out right. there who are putting themselves out there on a consistent basis. And when I started to recognize that this was the differentiator, me just putting my, my thoughts and my lessons learned and my experience and documenting the journey, mm. which we, if you know and love Gary Vee as I do, he was the first one that sort of incepted, you know, like uh, he Leo DiCaprio'd me <laughs> and put that idea like, dude, you need to document your journey. So my very first podcast four or five years ago, I was in my basement, dude, on my cell phone, recording into an app and saying, hey, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm recording. And this is the lessons learned. And I'm sure if I go back and listen, if anyone goes back and listen, you know, I didn't know crap back then. Like I thought yeah. I knew what I was talking about, but I was being vulnerable. That's the key. If you can put yourself out there and you want to differentiate yourself, be true, be honest, be vulnerable, because that's how people relate to you. That's how people understand you're human and you're not one of these guys that's puffing his chest and banging and ruffling you know, his feathers because you're sharing your failures and you're putting out lessons so that they don't have to make the mistakes that you're making. So that's what I did. I, I wrapped my head around that and I implemented on it. I implemented it. And, you know, years later, I was like, wow, this is, this has proven itself to work over time. Didn't happen overnight. It took years and years and years and years, but eventually what you do and you create and what you realize is, wow, I just created a breadcrumb, a digital breadcrumb yes. of my story and journey 
So it leads to me now, and I just created trust because now they know who I am, they like what I'm saying, and they like me, hopefully, and then now they trust me by the time we shake hands at a meeting or a virtual thing like this or a podcast, they're like, I just want to continue hanging out. I just want to work with you. Now that was all done, and you know we have our mutual friend Rory who talks about it's the digitization of your reputation. Yes. I just call it your online reputation, and that's what we're doing. And it's necessary at this point. There's Agreed. really no question. Agreed. So in the spirit of Stephen Covey, beginning with the end in mind, you mentioned a couple yes. really powerful words about why this personal branding work, this digitization of reputation matters, one of which is trust. And then the other, this kind of breadcrumb trail, the body of knowledge and thought leadership that comes from doing it. So let's fast forward a bit. Maybe the engineering leader listening has never even thought about putting themselves out there before. And they're asking that question, why do this? Take us to the end game, Eric. Why would you suggest this matters in the world of business and career? And what's the end? There's two choose your own adventures, so to speak. There's the one where you want to create a business potentially, and you want to offer value to the world, right? And you do that by, by creating results, getting someone to the end and being along the journey with them. So that's, that's a company. That's what I did and continue to do. But then there's also the person that wants to succeed up the corporate ladder. They want to be the VP. They want to be the president. They want to be a partner in whatever industry, whatever company that they're currently working in. Now today, Zach, today's day and age, when I was growing up, it didn't matter what your online reputation was, but yeah. today it does matter because as statistics show, especially from you know our group Brand Builders, statistics show that it is expected for you to have a personal brand at any level, whether you're your attorney, your CPA, your corporate, your C-suite level person, people want to do business with people if they have that online reputation set up because now you're doing all the hard work for them. They don't need to go, give me your five references. Let's have six interviews with you. If you're putting yourself out there through podcast guesting or a podcast, or you have a book or you speak on stage, whatever it is where you're putting yourself out there, there's a way for people to access your life and whatever version of it you want to put out there, right? A lot of people are very private. They don't put their family or whatever it is. It's up to you, really, truly. You have control over the narrative, over the visuals, mm. over the story that people will consume when deciding if they want to work with you. I, I just want to put a giant exclamation point on what you just said, because it's easy, especially if you're in a big company, you might feel that you've got a safe, secure job. You're getting that W-2 morphine drip paycheck every month. And it may feel like none of this is necessary. This You're tempted to tune into a different podcast right now. You know, as an engineering leader, it's like, this doesn't apply to me. But it absolutely does. And I've seen it with our clients. I see it all the time. And honestly, who doesn't at least check your LinkedIn profile and Google you, it's happening. You may not realize it's happening. Even your peers are checking your online presence as part of getting to know you in the office and your suppliers, your vendors, your partners, everybody. And so I, I hope people will really take to heart, Eric, what you just shared, because it, it matters now and it's going to matter even more in the future. And I don't know, you, you spend a lot more time in this world than me. Can you make a case for why this is even more important five or 10 years from now than today? Yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to add. Please. And, and if, if you are listening to this and you're thinking that it doesn't apply to me, and Zach and I are saying it absolutely does and, and we need to pay attention to it, is because say you are C-suite or say you are part of a team within a corporation or a company, well, when other people are looking to be hired or join the group, they're going to look at who's related. They'll go to LinkedIn and they'll see, these are the people that work there. And they're gonna eventually click onto and tap onto your profile. And they're gonna get this holistic view based off everything they see in the company and make a decision too. It's not just we're choosing people to work with us. Yes. They are also choosing to work with, they are also making the decision to work with us as well. So you have to consider that there is a brand collectively that's being, being put out there. I liken it to the, to, to the Marvel movies, right? I'm a huge geek. And it started with Iron Man, right? 
But then we didn't realize at the time that they were setting up for something bigger than that, like Iron Man, Thor, Captain America. And then eventually they launched the Avengers. Yes. This is your Marvel. This is your franchise. You're a one piece within the bigger picture. And whether you like it or not, there's people that are going to judge and just make a decision based on working with you personally, working with your company, working with whatever it is that you're involved in. It matters. It matters. Just like in a band. You know the band. You love the band. You don't necessarily know everyone's name in the band. You know the front guy. But it's all a holistic sort of mishmash of, of, of something that's getting put out there that people want to consume. Oh, I love that you just got nerdy with me on it's your Marvel. <laughs> it's your Marvel. That's perfect. It really is. I love that. And so we could pick you know, a dozen different channels and methods and ways and to make this tactical the one that for you and I, we have in common and you are truly one of the world's best at is podcasting. And I joked with you before we hit record today that literally you know, you've been on the calendar for a while now waiting for this interview. And in the last couple of weeks, I've had three clients ask me the question, what do you think about starting a podcast? You know, they listen to the Happy Engineer podcast and they're asking these questions about branding. They have ideas, they have projects and they're, what do you think? Should I start a podcast? And so you know, you've been doing this longer than I have, Eric. If somebody says, hey, is it, am I too late to the podcasting game? Like, is this worth it or should I do it? What would you say to that engineering leader who's thinking about, should I start a podcast? Again, we'll go back to goals, Zach. Uh, it's too late if you want to be the next Joe Rogan, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. You want to be the next Dax Shepard. And the thing is about those guys, and I'm going to put this out there, for anyone who uh, those guys, understand that they, they, they work the cheat code. What do I mean by that? They had an audience going in, right? They were celebrities coming in to the podcast. So they already had a following. Yes. So for normal people like you and I, we don't have a following. So the odds of us becoming the next Joe Rogan, it's an uphill battle, right? And it's also managing expectations. If you want to start a podcast and think, how do I monetize this? Uh, what's the ROI on this? Like, then you then your goals are out of order, right? Because what we need to do is offer value first. We mm -hmm. need to give. We need to build a community. Like, they already had all that going. So how do you do that? When you're asking right up front, you're creating a transactional experience for someone, and that breaks trust right off the bat, right off the bat. You have to genuinely want to offer and provide value in someone's life. So that's the number one piece. Number two is- well, Hold on, before number two, really quick, Eric. Yeah. That point, I just want everybody to know, that's not just about yeah. podcasting. Like that is you right. networking with anyone in your industry. That is you all the time. Like give to give, lead with value. Don't become known. We talked about reputation earlier. You do not want your digital reputation to be, I'm in it for the transaction and the ROI first nor do you want your real life reputation to be that. So just like, that's, that's a really awesome point. So keep going, number two. Yeah, yeah, and I just wanna to highlight too, and I had the fortune, and I'm not bragging when I mentioned his name, but I was having a conversation with Gary Vee about this, and he told me in one of my companies as I was asking for advice, he said, dude, you created this company and you built a community, but he said, you started with a transaction very early. I was charging admission to come to an event that I started, 3K to get in the door, which was fine. It seemed like a really wonderful business, but then it started to kind of like waver and it wasn't growing the way I wanted it to grow. And that was what he said. He said, you were impatient. You created a transactional relationship mm. too soon. So there's my failure and lesson learned that I want to impart to the audience so you don't have to mess it up like I did. Don't create a transaction, create a relationship. So number two is we're in the age where podcasting is ubiquitous, right? Podcasting is a necessity. Podcasting, it seems like everyone's doing it. Why? Because it's relatively new to the consumer space and the creator space, right? We're now creators were back in the day. Oh, you're a YouTuber. You're, you're this or that. You're an influencer, right? Yeah. That word has kind of gone away. Now it's more like you're a podcaster. And, and when I say podcaster, think of it this way. You're a content creator. Yeah. You're not necessarily a podcaster. And Zach and I was talk were talking about this before the cameras turned on and the mic turned on, is that we're creating content, right? We're not necessarily podcasters. We're business owners who happen to have a podcast, right? And that podcast we leverage as a relationship builder. 
right? A way to get to know someone that we want to talk to. So when you hesitate and you think of like, everyone has a podcast and, you know, everyone's doing what I'm doing. That's like someone saying, I'm not going to write a book because Barnes and Noble is full. Amazon is full. Why is it that no one is hesitating, less people are, in terms of writing a book, uh -huh. right? There's not enough books. There isn't enough information <laughs> out there. Why? Because there's no one telling your story. Yes. Your book is going to look different on the shelf than the other person who's talking about the same topic. Why? Because that person is not you. Yes. You're going to design a completely different book cover. Your words, I can guarantee you 100%, the words in your book are going to be different than the book next to it That's and the right. book next to it, the book next to it, because you wrote it. So it's the same exact thing with podcasting. You can, you can start a podcast that you think everyone's talking about, but podcasting isn't common. Podcasting, there's 2.8 million podcasts that are out there in the podcast universe. You know how many are active, like actively putting one out every single week? Less than 400,000. Wow. Even less than that. I'm just saying there's not a lot of people who are active. Yeah. That's, I'm terrible at that's, memorizing statistics. That's all right. But, but yeah. point being, it's not as many as you think. And exactly. I'll even add to this, you know, don't just think about it as somebody going to Barnes & Noble and browsing the shelf. You know, if you're an engineering leader and you're applying for that senior director position or that VP position, and you're in a pool of five people, you know, and they all are getting checked out online, and you're the one who has this thriving content and thought leadership in your space with a pod like this is a it's a very small field that we're talking about that's actually being considered because it's mm -hmm. unlikely that on day one your goal is to retire early and make all your money as a podcaster it's about putting yourself out there like we talked about earlier the doors that may open on the back end are immeasurable i mean there's so many upsides but i love this so the era of podcasting it's not too late you, you can literally just by being consistent and putting content out stand out from the crowd and you're not competing with joe rogan or eric or zach you're just being yourself building a digital reputation so that the opportunities you do want to land you create this open door there's less friction to building trust i'd like to highlight as well and i agree with you 100 percent, zach is the one piece and the one component that a lot of people don't consider is who will i become throughout this process, throughout this journey, Ooh. right? So you start a podcast, I guarantee you 12 months from now, say you started today and 12 months from now, you are a completely different person. You have learned a boatload of information that otherwise you never would have learned if you did not go through the process of starting a podcast. Number one, it forces you to think about the value you provide in people's lives. It forces you to think about the solutions and the results and your avatar, your clientele, the people that you help and serve, and then it forces you to be consistent with the content that you're creating, right? It's muscle, it's going to the gym. If I didn't have a gym membership, I would probably never go to the gym, right? Well, obviously not, because I, I don't have my membership card. But the thing is, if you start a podcast, you're joining the gym, that's the first step. Now, you just have to hold yourself accountable by what? Getting a trainer or getting someone that's going to hold you accountable and you creating a podcast on a weekly basis does that for you. That's brilliant. For me too, Eric, and I'd love to know if you relate to this. I feel like my world is bombarded with inputs, constant inbound of information and consumption. And doing this podcast has been one of the most powerful things that forces me to pause the inputs and actually create, to have an output, to have to distill all of my own thoughts and learn about these amazing guests and then have these really dynamic conversations. And just to get out of constantly listening to other people's voice and have my own voice, that to me was one of the most transformational parts about doing this. I don't know, does that relate for you? Yeah. 100%. Now, people will think, you know, when they hear what you just said as well, that, oh, but Zach, like you said, it's information. There's a lot of information. You can consume it or you can create it. Either way, there's a lot of it, right? And the thing is that I've noticed is throughout the last couple of decades, information is abundant and people yeah. don't pay for that anymore as they used to, you know, pay for 
Tony Robbins cassettes and then CDs and right, right, right. go to his seminars, right? Now he gives it away, right? We're in the day and age of you have to offer value, right? Jab, 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 right hook, as Gary calls it. So the thing is, information is not paid for any, mm. anymore, but people pay for organization of that information, right? Implementation of that information. So if you want to start a podcast and you think, what's the end goal of mine? I want to, okay, I want to create a thought leadership platform, but then also you can create something for people to organize themselves, to hold them accountable, to implement the ideas that you're sharing on your show. That's a wonderful way to create a side business in the beginning, mm -hmm. knowing that the podcast is going to produce some ROI for you totally. if you do it right. So let's, in the spirit of being an engineer, I love tactics and, and the Y equals F of X, the systems, Eric, and I know we don't have time to go through everything, but if you would just lay out for someone, maybe they're like, okay, this is cool, I wanna do it. What would you give us are the, just how to begin, first steps, the mechanics, if somebody wants to take massive action and go launch a podcast, where do they start? So it's, it's gonna be a little intimidating when I frame it this way, but if you put the work in, in engineering, you hire an architect before you start, you know, building and laying the foundation and putting sheetrock and and the framework of a house up, right? You have to hire someone that has the ideas. So that, of course, is you plus an architect, someone that can help you create the structure based off the goals that you have. So what are the goals? And we talk about this, Zach and I talk about this with our other group, is that you first you have to uh, you have to understand, okay, what problem do I solve, right? Write that down. What problem do I solve? And then what is the end result that I provide for people? Like, how do I get them from point A to point Z? But then in the middle, the alphabet in between the A and Z is how do you uniquely solve that problem? So that's the lesson. I mean, that is the, the, the tactical things that you can do when you put pen to paper. Like, what problem do I solve? How, what are the results that people are gonna achieve when they work with me? And how am I uniquely going to solve the problems for them? And then we start to market those bookends, right? And then that is amazing work that you can put in that will create the structure of your podcast because then now you know why you're doing it. You know the end game for not just yourself, but for your audience because you're going to deliver that message with a clear framework of what you want to do with the podcast. Now, if it's introductions and relationships, that's baked in regardless of what you do, whether it's an interview podcast or a solo cast you are going to be providing value to people through this information. So like, that's where I would start, Zach. Yeah. But then of course, talking to your engineers and talking to the audience here, you have to have systems, you have to have processes, you have to have teams, you have to have people and a level of automation so that this stuff is clockwork. You don't wanna miss an episode because once you miss an episode, you're breaking the cadence and the trust of the audience that's looking forward to that episode mm -hmm. that's coming in, trust me, at least one person's looking forward to an episode and it's probably my mom, your mom. <laughs> no question. And that's the thing. It has to be consistent so that people know, oh, this is gonna be here. Zach's gonna be here every Tuesday morning for me and I'm gonna be able to jump in and learn something. So those are the things that I would highly recommend. You put the work in or find someone that yeah. can help you to, to uh, crystallize those ideas. That is definitely stuff that we do. We work with our clients, for six, typically six weeks, sometimes eight weeks to launch a podcast, but the structure of the show, sure. what style will it be, interview, solo cast, all that stuff. I'll just <laughs> say it this way, and I'm gonna be blunt, Eric. If the engineering leader listening wants to start a podcast and is intimidated by that, like, you're a freaking engineering leader. Like you design cars and you you know, build bridges and skyscrapers or full stack architecture to scale technology, you know, to billions of emails. I go back to a past episode with you know Donna. You can handle it. But I love what Eric said. Don't do it if you're not committed to consistency. To just put out two episodes and then never look at it again doesn't actually serve that end game of creating the thought leadership and the digital reputation that's going to help you, whether it's to become CTO at Meta or to one day start your own thing. You may not even know what that is today, but a decade from now when you're ready, you have this incredible reputation to launch from. So c consistency and commitment to me is probably the most important thing that you said. and. You know, shameless plug, Eric and his team are freaking fantastic at helping with all of this. So if you just want to show up and record and hit the easy button, I have no 
bashfulness at all saying like i love the fact that i can hit the easy button for this show and uh, i've got other work to do you know so for the engineering leader saying hmm, can i handle it well you absolutely can invest in those tools and resources it can be done so i don't know any other thoughts about don't do it unless you're committed to yeah. this what do you think i would at least commit to 12 months of a podcast because yeah. i'll tell you this with the clients we work with whenever i say that to someone 100% of them go beyond 12 months. Why? Because they're getting results, right? They understand it's not about monetizing the podcast and slapping a, a zip recruiter logo on the baby's forehead <laughs> yeah. when it was just born, right? You want it to breathe, you want it to grow, you want it to crawl, run, and eventually get to the point where people are looking into your show and saying, hey, Zach, I love what you're doing. Who's your audience again? And you're very clear on your audience. You're like, that's the demographic that I want to speak to. And would you mind if I put a 30 second spot? Yes, that's an, that, that is a really cool, nice to have. But at that point, you won't even care because you've created all these relationships. You've built all this trust. You've built a community. And that is critical is when you build a community. And I'm going to borrow from what I learned from Lewis Howes is when he said, when you write a book, if you have 100 people, in your community, that's all you need. Oh, if you wow. write a book, those 100 people can sustain you and your business forever. That's, right? that's all you need. And once you're in the home, this is, I love this one too from Lewis, is that once you're in the home, you're in the heart. Oof. And he was talking about a book at that point, but this is the same with a podcast because think about it. Why do we love the Rolling Stones? Why do we love Pearl Jam? Why do we love all these bands? We, as teens and young adults, would listen with our earbuds and we would feel the music and it would touch our heart and we would really understand where this artist was coming from it's the same exact thing with a podcast someone's got the earbuds in and they're running at the gym and they're listening to your voice and you're speaking to them yeah and you're you're and people don't remember what you said but they remember how you made them feel and that is critical with the podcast. And that is why it's exploding because people are beginning to realize, holy moly, this is a powerful tool that I can leverage in my business, in my personal brand, in my podcast. So with systems and processes, understand that there are ways to get beyond the barriers and break through the barriers of consistency mm -hmm. and let this batching. That's one thing I wanna share is like, I record every Thursday from morning to night, three or four episodes, and then I'm done for a month. One day of work creates yeah. Dozens and dozens and dozens of pieces of content. That's what we do is every episode gets chopped up into assets yeah. for every platform. And it's all automatically done. Uh, so that's where I highly recommend if you're going to do it, think of that game. Is like, how do yep. I systematize this Auto so that I don't have to do done. I, I love that word, Eric. Oh, man. <laughs> Engineers relate to this. Auto magic. That's what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. So, and I'll just bring it back one more time, too. If somebody's like, hey, I don't have a business. Like, just imagine if you're applying for a new role at a new company, you want a promotion, and you're building your career path, and that interviewer plugs into the digital universe the night before and sees, oh... Eric has a podcast and he's applying for this director position. I'm going to listen to one of those episodes tonight before the interview tomorrow. And that VP has you in their ear for 30 minutes or 60 minutes the night before. And you show up for that interview and they're asking you questions about your podcast and, and engaged in you. Just imagine how much of an advantage that is. In, you said I like the home and the heart, just that no like trust. Wow. I mean, you, you, what an advantage. So I, I think there's so many reasons we've laid out. I, I mean, yeah. here we're just like hammering on people. The message here is not <laughs> you have to start a podcast. The message is recognize that if you don't take the heartbeat of personal branding and what Eric's been sharing seriously, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to not only get a ton of reward in in the fulfilling experiences of doing it, but an edge in a global marketplace where, frankly, engineers who can work remotely in almost every discipline now, except for roads and bridges, <laughs> it's like, how do you compete? Well, here's a way. So, I want I want to share one last thing here, Zach. If we have a please, moment. do it. And the example that you shared, 
plays out in my head as this. Because of my personal brand and the opportunities that I provide clients and friends and partners or people that I want to talk to, right? So uh, I'm blessed enough to be able to work with VaynerMedia and Gary and his team. Well, I got close to Claude Silver, who's the chief heart officer of VaynerMedia. So to the point where she asked me to produce her podcast. So she is a client of ours. We, we produce Claude Silver's wow. podcast, Emotional Optimism. So how cool is this, dude? If and ever there was a time, let's say, you know, the meteor hit or whatever, the, the, the apocalypse came and, and there was only jobs and there was like I had to fold my company, whatever happens. I always know in the back of my mind, there's Claude Silver and dozens of others that I am close to at that high letter, level leadership in multiple companies that I would work for at a drop of a hat. Yes. Hey, Claude, you looking for? Yes, Eric. Because she knows, she knows me, she's worked yeah. with me. And now I, why? Because I had a podcast, <laughs> because I had an opportunity mm. to share with her and say, hey, I'm not saying, hey, can you go have a cup of coffee with me in New York City? I'm saying, hey, be a guest on my show, speak on my stages, right. do whatever it is that I can give to you. What you're doing is you're creating a platform for others to share their thoughts, their ideas, and, and their value in the world. You're giving, you're giving, giving, giving. Your podcast gives nonstop. Even when you're sleeping, That's right. it's giving. Mm, I love that. Eric, if the engineering leader listening is convinced now that they want to chat about this and discover more about what On Air Brands does and how you could help press the easy button or just get some support on how do I discover more about this and other aspects of branding and channels to go put yourself out there, where can they find you and the amazing work that you're doing? Yeah, I have something to give everyone. If you're thinking about podcasting, I have a podcast giveaway. It's a guide. Uh, you can find that at Eric, E-R-I-K Cabral. And I'm sure hopefully Zachary's team will put this link in the of notes, course. but it's ericcabral.co slash guide. So ericcabral.co slash guide. And in there will be a downloadable PDF all about podcasting and tips for you as well as a way to schedule some time. So time is my most valued commodity, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give that to your audience. Uh, 30 minutes consult, uh, free consult. If you want to chat for a little bit, just throw some ideas, some spaghetti at the wall, and uh, see what sticks. What an amazing offer. Time is our, our only exclusively limited and leveling resource. So Eric, that's super generous. Thank you for that. Yeah. I always end in the same place. And You'll appreciate this with the work you do and our engineers who listen. You know, I believe great coaching, great engineering, it all has in common that the questions we ask lead and answers then follow. And so if we want to create a great brand, if we want to create success, be happy, let's pay attention to the questions we ask ourselves. So for that engineering leader listening today who wants to create an advantage in their career through personal branding and everything we covered in this conversation, what would be the question that you would lead them with today? It's a deep one, honestly, Zach, but what gets you up in the morning? Mm. Now that changes over time. It changed for me and I used to get up every morning for the money. And then I realized at some point I needed a greater purpose and that was to change the world one mic at a time. And that became my company's mantra. And how do I do that? Through various ways that we discussed here. But you find your why, your reason, your mission, your purpose. That will transcend making money because as I have now grown to understand that money is a byproduct of value. And once you create more value in the world and become more valuable, time is irrelevant. It's about you stepping in the moment and being able to change someone's life within minutes, within seconds, by just a conversation. So I'm hoping that at some point, anyone who's listening thinks like you are capable of that. Why? Because I did it. <laughs> I did it and I was a hot mess. So I'm inspired that you are listening to this podcast and eventually will find that purpose hmm. in your life. Eric, you did it. You're still doing it. Thank you so much for the value in this conversation. I got so much from it and uh, you're just amazing the work you do thank you so much and this has been a true pleasure man thanks brother thanks for the opportunity and uh, I, I can't wait to continue this bromance that we're having, so <laughs> thanks brother cheers hello my friend zach white here again and i wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the happy engineer podcast thank you so much for investing your time with me today it is an absolute pleasure 
to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort, create courage, and let's do this.